oatmeal and I see the Sinai residents are all, I can see my big face on that screen. That is scary. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, uh, hi to everyone. Welcome and, there, and looking forward to this hour that we have. I am going to pass the mic to my dear friend and peer mentor and mentor, uh, Ravi Singh. Ravi, how are you? Oh, great, great, Reza. You're, you're just as much a mentor of mine uh, as I am of yours, I guess. So I um, uh, appreciate you uh, having us on today. Uh, so we have a PGY2 here at Sinai uh, Hospital, uh, Suraj Hande. He has a, a great case. And actually, Rafa just left today and Rafa actually listened into this case. And he's like, this is a very good case. We should bring it on CPS and discuss uh, and I just want to make you aware the whole um, residency program doesn't is not aware of this case. So only a limited number of people were able to join in and listen to the case. So we have a smashing case for everyone today. So uh, I'll let Dr. Hande um, Osuraj uh, introduce himself. Thank you, Dr. Kun, -kun. Um, uh, Thank you, everyone from uh, at the CPS problem solvers. Uh, team and I would also like to thank uh, our chief uh, Sashi and Sonia for uh, allowing me and presenting me with this opportunity to present um, my case here at this platform. So, yeah. so Rich, thank you so much. Am I am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, fantastic. Welcome. Looking forward to the case. We have. Uh, Sawyer, who's going to be scribing, and uh, Sawyer, do you want to just unmute yourself and, and say a few words? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sawyer. I'm a fourth-year medical student uh, from Lecon Bradenton, and happy to be here with you all today. Excellent. I think we can get going. Robbie's going to join a little later, but um, Sawyer, if you want to take over the screen, and then uh, Suraj, whenever you're ready, feel free to uh, start the case presentation. All right, Serge, I think we are ready for you, my friend. All right, uh, so let's start. So here uh, we are presenting um, a case. Uh, we have a 49 year old uh, gentleman. He has history of polysubstance use. Um, he used alcohol, tobacco, cocaine, and ecstasy in the past and currently not using anything actively except for marijuana. And he also has a recent history of incarceration. Um, he was uh, recently got out of the uh, prison and he presented to the ED uh, with chief complaints of bilateral hearing loss uh, for the past one month. Um, he describes his uh, chief complaints further. Uh, he says that um, he's experiencing bilateral hearing loss um, and left-sided hearing uh, impairment is more uh, than the right, um, and the the onset was gradual, progressively worsened over the period of past one month, uh, and he describes it as decreased hearing, um, also um, associated with earfulness and occasional tinnitus. Um, it is present at all times uh, with no correction, with no correlation to uh, any of the environmental settings, uh, background noise. Um, um, and it is not associated with any ear pain or drainage, no associated headaches or visual disturbances, no vertigo or dizziness. Uh, he denies any recent trauma to the, um, especially to the head uh, and denies any exposure to any loud noise. He denies using any um, uh, headphones to listen to loud uh, music. He denies any ear surgeries um, and uh, he states that he uh, he went to an urgent care for evaluation of his ears, uh, given that um, he has been reporting hearing uh, loss for some time. Uh, they were concerned about um, uh, wax impaction, so they ruled out uh, impaction uh, with the ear exam, uh, and they sent him to the ED for further evaluation of his uh, hearing loss. Um, so overall, um, in a nutshell, uh, we have a 49-year-old gentleman 
uh, coming into the ED with chief complaints of bilateral hearing loss. Um, and um, we can um, discuss some of the DDs going on from here at this point. If anybody. Thank, th thank you so much, sir. It's, what a fascinating start with a chief complaint that we don't encounter often. Since I don't encounter this complaint um, frequently, I have to be very systematic in my approach and very analytical. Um, and it also excites me because I know this case will serve as a case that will lead to growth of my clinical reasoning. And I think really importantly, um, we have to look at the problem representation. This is a young person who's presenting with subacute bilateral hearing loss. And something that Suraj said was so important. And he said they looked into the patient's ear. Guys, this is critical. I remember, Suraj, I was uh, working in Baltimore, and I had a patient who we thought was demented. And we put a sign on this patient's door hard of hearing, it was an elderly individual. And we kept yelling and we said, this person is confused. You know what the problem was? It was cerumen impaction. Okay. Once we cleared the cerumen, all of a sudden the patient's mental status cleared up. So I think the crux of this case comes down to two things. One is, are we dealing with a sensory neural hearing problem or conductive, that's one branch. The other branch is, are we dealing with a localized neurologic process versus a widespread systemic inflammatory process? This is really the two branch points. So the, this is really the lens on how we will approach this case. And to address the first question of sensory neural versus conductive, I know in med school, they teach you the um, Rene and Weber sign to see which one it is. Already here, um, Suraj has given us enough information that prioritizes a sensory neural process over a conductive process. He gave us a terrific otologic examination by looking within the ear canal. But you can ver further confirm that hypothesis on the physical exam by seeing the um, Renee and Weber test and to see which one it prioritizes. But I'm getting the flavor of sensory neural, something that's involving the vestibular cochlear nerve bilaterally. And so the question becomes, if that's the problem we're trying to solve, what can be the possible pathologic processes that might involve those bilateral vestibular cochlear nerves? The other thing that I think is really important, the second part of this, is are we dealing with the widespread systemic inflammatory process? Although Suraj didn't tell us much in the HPI, like fevers, night sweats, weight loss that might suggest an autoimmune process that can have autologic um, manifestations like uh, GPA or Kogan syndrome or relapsing polychondritis, you can never exclude inflammation from the uh, DDX. Now with regard to the um, poly substance abuse and the history of that, I think knowing exactly what substances are being used is helpful. Um, to give you an example, uh, many times when people use cocaine, it may be laced with levamazole, and levamazole can lead to a vasculitic process that usually presents as um, sort of earlobe inflammation and redness. So all that is to say, as we get more data, this is not a person who has hearing loss due to aging. You know, when we turn 70, 80, hopefully you all reach that age, you can start having hearing loss with presbycusis. This is not that. Uh, so there's definitely pathology involved. The question is, what is that pathology? 
two clarifying points. We need to confirm it's sensory neural, and then we need to know if there's widespread inflammation. And I think the more data that Sarid shares with us, the more progress we can make. So uh, moving on from here, um, uh, we are going to discuss more data here. And uh, past medical history um, is, uh, he has a past medical history of asthma and uh, substance use. Um, he has used cocaine in the past. Uh, he has also used uh, ecstasy as well as alcohol and tobacco. Um, he did not, uh, and currently he's not using any of uh, these above said uh, substances, except for right now he's smoking marijuana. Um, uh, social history, uh, he's single. Uh, he was recently incarcerated um, and um, he currently lives with his daughter and he's a former smoker, 10 pack year history um, and Family history uh, is significant for a heart disease in his uh, father uh, who, who passed away at, at the age of around 60 to 70. He uh, also uh, significant for ESRD uh, in his brother. And medication history at this moment, um, he, does, he, he does not take any medications and allergic history, he denies any uh, allergies. Wonderful. Uh, sir, do you want to stop here or should we keep? Yeah. Do you want I, to give us? Yeah, we can um, okay. take a moment here. Awesome. I think Robbie is here, if I'm not mistaken. Hello. Thank goodness, Robbie, that you're here. We, we have a case of bilateral. Yeah. Did you hear this, the story you're up to date? No, I just listened to your poetic discussion, which summarized the case so well. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let me give the mic to you, my friend. All righty. Um, you know, I. I, I I think Reza's um, outline is so, so helpful. And the question is, um, is there anything else um, in the data that um, Suraj has given us that prioritizes one thing over the other? And for me, I'm, I'm struggling to. I think that the family history is very helpful in these instances because there are a whole variety of congenital syndromes that are described or not described that result in premature hearing loss. And the lack of that is very informative. And um, I think Reza already teased out <clears throat> very astutely what overlap can you have with substance use and hearing loss. And I think um, most patients with asthma just have asthma. Some patients with asthma get um, complications such as vasculitis, like EGPA, though the rate of hearing loss in that condition is less than its uh, cousin without the E, um, GPA alone. So those are threats to consider, but I, I think all this falls into, maybe this will be helpful information once we know exactly what we're dealing with. And right now, I think what we're dealing with is less clear. So we'll keep this in the background until we get more information. All right, Suraj, back to you. Thank you so much. Um, all right, further discussing, uh, moving on to uh, physical exams, uh, his vital signs at presentation, he was afebrile, his um, blood uh, his heart rate was around 70 beats per minute, blood pressure was 130 uh, by 80. Uh, he was setting, uh, at SpO2 of 99% on room air and his respiratory rate was uh, 16 per minute. Um, on general exam, he appeared to be a, a slim uh, gentleman. Um, he was laying in bed, no distress was noted. Um, while conversing with him, a, a bilateral uh, mild hearing impairment was uh, noticed. Uh, skin did not show any rashes or any prominent lesions. Um, and with respect to his uh, HEENT exam, um, head was normal cephalic. There was no trauma uh, noted. Uh, his eye exam, uh, his conjunctiva was uh, normal, um, no icterus, uh, no paler. Um, with respect to his oral exam, uh, he had poor dentition uh, on oral exam. Oropharynx appeared to, to be normal. And on uh, ear exam, uh, his Weber test uh, did not lateralize and his renes bilaterally uh, was noted to have uh, air, condu air conduction greater than the uh, bone conduction. Um, heart uh, cardiovascular exam, he, um, his rate was regular, regularly regular um, and he did not have any murmurs. 
Uh, he did not have a JVD um, and uh, he, his peripheral circulation was uh, normal um, and his fluid status, he was uvolemic. Uh, with respect to his lung exam, um, his lungs were clear to auscultate bilaterally. Uh, we did not uh, hear any wheezing or crackles um, and his chest expansion was normal. Um, abdominal exam was normal. Uh, his abdomen was soft, non-distended. It was non-tender on palpation and he had normal bowel sounds in all abdominal quadrants. Um, no suprapubic tenderness was noted. Uh, with respect to his extremities, um, extremities, we did not see any uh, track marks, uh, any, uh, any lesions, um, any trauma, um, and no peripheral uh, edema as well. Neurologic exam, he was alert oriented to time, place, and person. Um, he did not present any uh, motor or sensory deficits. Uh, we also did a short psych exam and our uh, impression was uh, he had intact memory, judgment and insight and his mood was normal um, and his affect was normal as well. So we can uh, take a, a moment here uh, yes, to further yes. decipher his, the, the physical exam. Uh, yes, so, Serge, this is, um, first of all, I want to thank you again for bringing this case to our virtual morning report because it's not a chief concern we see frequently. And I think what's striking to myself, Robbie, and the audience is how young this patient is. And yes, we have that background data of polysubstance abuse, which we will apply to our analysis of the foreground, but no one who's 49 should have hearing. It's like we already know this is pathologic and this should lead to a specific um, diagnosis. I think what was most important in the physical exam, again, what I was screening for was um, whether there was a fever or not to suggest inflammation. The lack of fever, again, doesn't exclude it. And I think really it just comes down to your Weber and Rene test. Our hypothesis that sensory neuropathology was prioritized over conductive, just based on the fact that you didn't see anything obstructing the auditory canal uh, seems accurate. Because what uh, Suraj did was basically he took the tuning fork, if you have one, he banged it against his hand and he saw is the conduction when he holds it by the ear um, greater than when he holds it at the bone. Because if you hold it at the bone and you can still sense it, then it tells you that um, sensory neural access is intact. Here, it seemed like the conduction was intact, but not the sensory neural access. So that's all I can summarize from this um, physical exam, but let me pass the mic to Robbie to see if he has anything to layer on that. No, not at all. I think it's just amazing that um, when somebody has a bilateral disease, how much harder it is, right? Because the truth is this exam, what, you expect everybody to have air conduction greater than bone conduction. That's normal. So for most people, if you tap the uh, tuning fork on their bone, the moment they stop hearing it there, you put it in front of the ear, they should hear it again. So how do you know that he has true hearing impairment? You don't know that because usually the other ear would serve as a control and most people have unilateral disease. And so the other ear... Um, uh, he would be able to be. He would able to. He would be able to hear it. So, if somebody has unilateral sensory hearing loss, which we see all the time, it's very very common. Um, you would put the tuning fork on their bone. They would not be able. They would as soon as they stop hearing it, they would then be able to hear it with air conduction. And as soon as they stop being able to hear it with air conduction, you put it over their other ear, and their other ear can still hear it. So you prove in that case that there's sensory neural hearing loss. So this is a really important pearl. When somebody has bilateral sensory neuro hearing loss, you, it makes it much harder for you to determine whether they have hearing loss at all. So you have to use and find yourself a normal ear. And good news, most of us who are doing the exam have normal ears. So how do you differentiate this case and prove that he has true hearing loss? You then, as soon as his air conduction diminishes, and he says, oh, I can't hear it anymore with air in both ears, you have to then put it in front of your ear. And if you still hear it, 
then he has bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. If you also can't hear it, then his hearing is just as good as yours, and you might be dealing with the perception of sensory neural hearing loss when there in fact isn't one. So um, this is a very complicated subject. I've been fooled by it multiple times, but the pearl here, the real deeper truth to look up later, is when both ears are affected, the DDX is either bilateral sensory neural hearing loss or no hearing loss at all, since we are primed to detect asymmetric hearing loss. That's what we're very good at. So when it's symmetric, you have to break the symmetry with your own ear as the normal and use that to your advantage. Already, I'll pass the mic back to you, Sven. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna jump on the, moving on, I'm gonna jump on the labs. Um, Firstly, uh, hematolo hematological labs, uh, his hemoglobin was 13.1, um, uh, hematocrit was uh, around 39, um, white cells, white WBC count was 11, platelets were uh, 381. Um, and uh, moving on to chemistry, his sodium uh, was 133, potassium was 3.5, and chloride was 99. Uh, his bicarb uh, was 20, 25. Magnesium was noted at 1.8. Phosphorus was 3.2. And calcium was 9.5. His uh, glucose uh, was around 211. And kidney function, um, his BUN was 10. And creatinine was 0 0.8. Uh, his total protein. Uh, was eight, albumin was 3.9, and other uh, liver parameters, AST was 19, ALT was 27, uh, ALKFOS was um, 82, and total bilirubin was 0 0.7. Uh, we also obtained a, a few uh, initial um, radiological tests. His uh, chest X-ray uh, appeared to be normal, um, and his CT head uh, did not show any acute uh, hemorrhagic, uh, any acute bleed. Uh, and again, uh, we'll, we'll take a moment here to further uh, discuss his uh, labs and initial diagnostic uh, radiological tests. No, I'll just say something real quick and then pass the mic to Prof. Rez, which is actually answering a question he asked. From the very beginning, Reza was saying, we need to understand if this is hearing loss or is this some other context that this hearing loss is happening in? And I think quite simply, the labs say that there is not much of a systemic signature of this hearing loss. So we've gone from bilateral sensory neural hearing loss to isolated bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. And I think that's this data makes that very leap um, uh, with much more clarity. Um, uh, Prof. Rez, what else do you have to add? Nada, I just wanted to just reflect on your um, interpretation of the exam. I thought it was extremely um, astute, and it just reminded me of bilateral ptosis and how difficult it is to tell when someone has bilateral ptosis um, or if you have bilateral mydriasis or dilate. Like, that's such an epic principle to take from this case. I uh, never thought about that, so just wanted to thank you for that. But Suraj, Mike, back to you, my friend. All right, thank you. So um, we spoke to the patient, um, and um, and he gave us a a, a, a few more uh, history points. Uh, we'll discuss that. But our next step was uh, we called neurology uh, because we were suspecting some underlying neurological process, um, and. Uh, so neurology was consulted with their evaluations, uh, a CBA or acute neurological process was uh, determined not to be the cause here. Uh, they did recommend uh, MRI and an ENT consult. Uh, ENT was consulted uh, and um, no um, abnormality was uh, found on their exam in the ED. Uh, moving further, uh, we, we ordered further tests uh, um, based on the patient's history, uh, we did a broad STD panel. HIV uh, was obtained. HIV was negative. Uh, hepatitis panel was negative for any 
uh, of the hepatitis infection. Um, chlamydia and gonorrhea were negative, um, but uh, syphilis uh, was tested and we saw that his VDRL was positive, uh, his FTA antibodies were positive, and his uh, ELISA uh, was positive with um, high reflex titer. Um, and at that uh, moment, uh, actually we can take a moment here uh, to decipher this, these uh, further findings. Suraj, th thank you so much. Yes, Reza, you're muted. Uh, Suraj, thank you so, so much. Uh, that was epic. I actually want to share something with you. First of all, I want to applaud Kirtan too. If you look at his DDX in the chat, I thought it was brilliant DDX, much like his tweet this morning on lepto-meningeal enhancement. But let me just share something with you. Uh, so um, you can see here uh, the our, our schema for syphilis. We actually have a 2.0 version of this, but I just pulled this one up. And basically, um, it's very difficult and sometimes overwhelming to interpret the serologic tests that involve um, syphilis. And this is what it's, is important to know, that you have uh, specific antibodies to um, the, the, the syphilis organism that will stay positive indefinitely. Then you have non-treponemal tests that sort of peak and then wane over time. Here, uh, Suraj, you told us that both, I think, the treponemal tests and the non-treponemal tests were positive, which would be consistent with syphilis. And then when you approach syphilis, I think the easiest way to, <clears throat> to do this is to know that the odo and ocular manifestations of syphilis can really happen anytime, meaning from three weeks to 30 years. So neurosyphilis, you always have to entertain this possibility independent of the time course. So then the question becomes, is this consistent with syphilis? I would say absolutely, this is consistent with neurosyphilis. If we come down here to the odo process, you can see clearly, um, although we have unilateral hearing loss, this patient had tinnitus as well and has the positive serology. So a patient like this, you have to do a couple of things. One is you should really get an HIV test in this patient to make sure that they don't have concomitant HIV. Because if they do, that would push me towards pursuing a lumbar puncture. Um, and then secondly, you want to treat this as neurosyphilis because the eyes and the ears are right next to the brain, right? That's the eyes are the gateway to the brain as are the ears. So that's how we want to treat it. And we have a 2.0 version of this schema if someone can include it in the chat because we include the management arm there as well. But let me pass the mic to Robbie to see what he has to add to that. Absolutely nothing. I think this is such an amazing case. Um, and uh, I think if you haven't heard of this, this is a great case to get that rep in. Um, most cases of sensory neural hearing loss are um, idiopathic and unknown, and they occur abruptly. And um, the big red flag here was this is bilateral. So my only piece of advice is you actually don't need to go uh, um, super intense and do an extensive workup in patients who have unilateral sensory neural hearing loss that's abrupt. Um, but as soon as it's bilateral, all of a sudden, um, things like syphilis and others pop into the equation. And I think this is a great case that illustrates just how silent it can be. You know, it's literally like there's no other signature of this disease process. Um, that is a little bit surprising because most people um, do have other manifestations of syphilis at the time, but it's, it, it isn't the, one of the greatest mimickers in medicine for, uh, uh, for no reason. So thank you so much for the great, great uh, um, a presentation of this case. And I, I'll pass the mic to you to see what reflections you have on taking care of this patient. And of course, importantly, what happened to him, how you treated him and how he did. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much for uh, those uh, points. Um, so yeah, uh, looking at uh, his uh, lab work, uh, we had a discussion with neurology ENT and we decided to go ahead and start the treatment of uh, syphilis. Um, um, deeming the hearing loss was uh, due to early mani manifestation of syphilis and we made a diagnosis of otosyphilis here. We started him, him on uh, IV penicillin uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, CSF was also obtained at a later point of time. Uh, and then um, I'm gonna discuss a few points uh, about, about dealing with uh, syphilis and neurosyphilis, uh, as well as uh, a patient presenting with uh, hearing loss. So uh, the overall, uh, the differential diagnosis of uh, hearing loss is very extensive, as we know, uh, a few common uh, <clears throat> DDs would be Meniere's disease, uh, tympanic membrane rupture, uh, any infectious disease, viral, uh, bacterial in origin, any kind of inflammation um, um, and auto autoimmune disorders, um, vascular alteration, especially uh, intracranial around, around the ear apparatus, acoustic neuroma. Uh, these are uh, some of the uh, common uh, DDs. Uh, however, in most of the patients, uh, no underlying pathology will be found and even the tests available today um, um, don't do um, a great, I mean, uh, a pathology uh, is very difficult to uh, kind of pinpoint what's causing the hearing loss. Um, and usually most of the hearing loss um, are termed as idiopathic, um, but here, uh, Neurosyphilis and otosyphilis can uh, present at any point of time uh, during the course of the disease. Uh, and otosyphilis and ocular syphilis uh, should be the, uh, could be the initial presentation uh, when it comes to syphilis. Um, hearing loss with or without tinnitus should be considered as a part of neurological -like symptoms um, or signs of neurosyphilis. Like ocular syphilis, hearing loss may or may not be accompanied by meningitis. Um, so accompanied sensory neural hearing loss may be unilateral or bilateral, usually progresses rapidly and may have a sudden uh, onset in our case. So overall, um, <clears throat> treatment wise, um, when, when you're suspecting otosyphilis, um, it is recommended to start uh, IV penicillin uh, even before you obtain those CSF studies. And that's what we did uh, here. Uh, and uh, usually, uh, there have been cases where improvement in hearing has been noted uh, after uh, starting penicillin. Um, so I think uh, I would, I'm, I'm gonna stop here. Uh, and if we have any further teaching points here, you're welcome to share, thank you. You're way too kind, my friend. Thank you so much for such a great presentation and the teaching points and for um, bringing it to us. I also see that um, a lot of your colleagues here, I just noticed that you're, a lot of your colleagues here are watching, which I'm sure it's a treat for them too. Um, ha what happened to his, is this, uh, I'm sorry if I missed it, um, what happened to his his hearing? Did he get better or is it too early to know? Uh, so he, he did not uh, present any, like he did not uh, mention any difference with his hearing, uh, but we did still complete uh, a 14 day course of IV. Yeah. Uh, uh, IV penicillin. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that's a, such a fascinating thing to analyze at the end because you mentioned that most people have unknown, uh, unexplained disease, but you also mentioned that syphilis can do it too. And so, how do you tease out between idiopathic and syphilis? And I think the best way is to response to therapy. And the fact that he didn't improve might mean that his damage was too severe from syphilis or that it was actually unrelated to syphilis. And unfortunately, yeah. Um, that's always something you have to keep in the back of your mind whenever a disease can be a or minimally symptomatic, such as syphilis, which is crazy. You know, most people who have syphilis have late latent syphilis and they have no symptoms from it. And so I think it's an interesting question and an impossible question to answer. Did he have incidental syphilis along with idiopathic uh, sensory neural hearing loss, which is probabilistically not uncommon? Like what's the probability of idiopathic sensory neural hearing loss and what's the probability of asymptomatic syphilis? And both of those aren't very low numbers. Um, if he got better with treatment, it would be done. Um, so, you know, I think it just goes to show you that you never, never can know for sure in clinical reasoning. And instead of being paralyzed and annoyed by the uncertainty, you just celebrate it and know that the only time you aren't seeing it is because you aren't looking hard enough. Um, or maybe, you know, he'll get better later. You all, you all, that is also another uh, possibility. But if we spent the rest of this time talking about all the possibilities, we'd go until tomorrow. So I will stop talking and pass the mic to rest to see if he has any additional reflections. <laughs>
<laughs> no, but I, I think that's an incredible reflection. And Serge, let me ask you two questions. One is the CSF, was the VDRL positive or was yeah. there a lymphos? It was positive. Yeah. Um, and then secondly, was there any question as whether to proceed with the L? Is it something that you guys, um, was it something that, uh, <laughs> that you guys were... The, the recording person telling me to stop asking my question. Was it was it something that, can you just explain the thought process? Was there any discussion behind whether CSF needed to be obtained or, or not? Uh, at that, uh, once we obtained the, the serum uh, VDRL uh, uh, and we, we saw that serum, serum VDRL is positive, uh, we had a discussion that um, CSF uh, can be obtained at a later point. Uh, but right now, let's just based on the, um, the clinical picture as well as the serum test, we decided to treat, start the IV penicillin, um, keeping in mind that uh, he had his uh, he, he was presenting with hearing loss, and uh, so we straight went ahead and started penicillin, and um, at a later point, CSF was obtained. Oh, that, that makes so much sense. And would that CSF ultimately change like the treatment plan for the patient, whether it's positive or negative? I don't know the answer to that. I was just curious if anyone does. So uh, it, it, it did not change our approach. We continued uh, IV penicillin for him. And uh, the exact protocol is uh, around four, 4 million units every four hours for 10 to 14 days. Um, based on patient's uh, clinical picture. So, yeah. Th thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Serge. Um, let me pass the mic to our dear colleague and friend, Kirtan, who jumped in uh, to take over the teaching points. And thank you, uh, Sawyer, for scribing. And thank you, Serge, for presenting. Thank you so much. Hello, friends. So, you know, firstly, I wanted to thank you, Dr. Suraj. But apart from Dr. Suraj, I also wanted to thank all the Sinai chief residents who joined us, Dr. Singh and even Dr. Sharf, you know, like she is the program director and she was gracious enough to come even to the VMRs, which we had, you know, a few months back and we were inviting all the residency programs. And today also she was there. So always appreciate when program director are there to enjoy the clinical reasoning as well. So thanks for joining us. And regarding the case, talking about the first eloquent, that how we approach the hearing loss. So, you know, I really loved Reza's approach that from the beginning itself, Reza pointed out that are we, in, I mean, are we dealing with only a localized ear issue or is it something more than that? What if we are dealing with a systemic inflammatory process? So, for instance, the first record itself, Professor has mentioned the possibility of granulomatosis with polyangitis and how it can cause inflammation of the ear or the cartilage and which can lead to the hearing loss. So that was, you know, kind of pure point if you see about it. If we only think that it is localized, then we would never expand our brain beyond that possibility. So I guess Professor Rez thinking in the first record kind of shaped our pathway. Now talking about the second point, again, Professor Rez alluded to the fact that if the patient has history of substance abuse, then how we can reconcile it with the possibility of hearing loss. And then he told us that, you know, cocaine can be adulterated with numerous other substances like levamizole. And levamizole is one of those substances which can predispose you to develop some vasculitis. And also, you know, for instance, I remembered that levamizole is one of those drugs which can cause double positivity. So it can cause ANA positive as well as NK positive. So that's how powerful levamizole is. It can fool your immune system and can give you numerous serological results and subsequent vascular manifestations. So that was the critical clue. And then finally, in the examination part, Rabi enlightened us that how, you know, all our tests like Rene test, Weber test rely on the presence of asymmetry of presentation. So if some deficits are present in both the ears, and if they are, you know, equal in intensity, then there is very difficult to catch that whether we're dealing with SNHL or whether we're dealing with conductive hearing loss and where we can localize it, right? So that was really interesting. And then finally, moving to the last part that if we join the first helicopter to the last helicopter, that what Reza alluded to, that is this a systemic condition? And I remember this because this is one of the best papers that I had read. In fact, I have shared this, pe this paper with almost all of my colleagues, all of my friends at CV Solas, and it is titled as B syndromes, which stands for brain, eye, ear syndromes. And the beauty of B syndromes is that often we think that, okay, in our case, we don't have involvement of eye, we don't have involvement of brain, then how we can apply the algorithm of B syndromes to our case? But the thing is that at current, the patient doesn't have the involvement of brain or eye. Nobody knows what will happen in 10 years from now. 
so you know all these syndromes are a continuum they aren't uh, separated in a specific point in time patient doesn't have involvement now but he may have later later right so we can still apply that algorithm and if you see the b syndromes then it mentions that you know things like gps is there suzak syndrome is there cogen syndrome is there and i remember that 4 weeks ago in any gym a case was published in which the patient had hearing loss but the patient also had a pruritic rash on the chest few weeks ago and you know people think that okay it is just a mosquito bite or whatever and they shoo it away and in that any gym case the diagnosis was indeed otosyphilis so you know and in that case also they discussed that how cogan syndrome can mimic the syphilis and how we have to be vigilant about the ocular syphilis and otosyphilis as dr suraj mentioned in the end that it can present in isolation as well so i really love the approach of b syndromes and how we can apply it to our patient even if only a single symptom is present and lastly i wanted to you know thank rabi for always reminding us that how the base date of disease is important just because you have isolated serological findings you can't you know tag it that this is a slam dunk for otosyphilis what if the patient has idiopathic snhl as well and if you apply the base date of the disease then you will realize that it is indeed a possibility that the patient had idiopathic snhl coexisting with syphilis but the fact that csf vdrl was positive as as i alluded to in the end part definitely points us that maybe neurosyphilis was to blame in this condition so thank you for amazing case suraj and for uh, amazing discussion by rabi and reza i love it keep your time um any time i listen to you speak i learn more then when i went into the case discussion robby he really makes us teaching points <laughs> stellar remember said it's incredible really, i don't think you should put kirtan in parentheses you should just put teaching points by kirtan period you know yeah take uh, remove my name from this she just put kirtan at the top and i'm going to publicly out maria unfortunately she didn't read your paper kirtan so <laughs> and i never got the paper kirtan <laughs> You have some work to do, my friend. You have to convince Maria to read the paper, but it sounds like this case convinced her, and you have to you have to send it to Prof. Reds. Um, I will read it again. It was an I will just wanted to endorse that it really was an absolutely incredible review of B, which you should read it just for the title alone, if anything else. Oh, Charmin needs it too. Kirtan, we're giving you a lot of homework, a lot of sense of convincing. <laughs> we fact check Kirtan and him sending it to all the CP scholars. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna get thirty emails, dear Tom. <laughs> sure, we'll do that. <laughs> all right, y'all. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, um, Suraj, for a fantastic presentation. Thank you to everyone at Sinai for joining us, and um, thank you, uh, Kirsan, for the teaching points. And um, and um, I actually didn't get to meet our our guest scribe for today, um, uh, Sawyer. Nice to see you. Thank you for doing that. And a final thank you to Maria for tolerating my annoying poking. Bye.